Ratlines comprised a system of escape routes for Nazis and other fascists fleeing Europe at the end of World War II. These escape routes mainly led toward havens in Latin America, particularly Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Colombia, Brazil, Uruguay, Mexico, Guatemala, Ecuador, and Bolivia, as well as the USA and Switzerland. There were two primary routes, the first went from Germany to Spain, then Argentina, the second from Germany to Rome to Genoa, then South America. The two routes developed independently but eventually came together to collaborate. The ratlines were supported by clergy of the Catholic Church, and historian Michael Fayer claims this was supported by the Holy See. Topic. Early Spanish rat lines The origins of the first rat lines are connected to various developments in Vatican-Argentine relations before and during World War II. As early as 1942, Monsignor Luigi Maglioni contacted Ambassador Lobet, inquiring as to the willingness of the government of the Argentine Republic to apply its immigration law generously, in order to encourage at the opportune moment European Catholic immigrants to seek the necessary land and capital in our country." Afterwards, a German priest, Anton Weber, the head of the Rome-based Society of St. Raphael, travelled to Portugal, continuing to Argentina, to lay the groundwork for future Catholic immigration, this was to be a route which fascist exiles would exploit. According to historian Michael Fayer, this was the innocent origin of what would become the Vatican rat line. Spain, not Rome, was the first center of ratline activity that facilitated the escape of Nazi fascists." Although the exodus itself was planned within the Vatican. Among the primary organizers were Charles Lescat, a French member of Action Française an organization suppressed by Pope Pius XI and rehabilitated by Pope Pius XII, and Pierre Day, a Belgian with contacts in the Spanish government. Lescat and Day were the first to flee Europe with the help of Argentine Cardinal Antonio Caggiano. By 1946, there were hundreds of war criminals in Spain, and thousands of former Nazis and fascists. According to then United States Secretary of State James F. Burns, Vatican cooperation in turning over these asylum seekers was negligible. According to Fayer, Pius XII preferred to see fascist war criminals on board ships sailing to the New World rather than seeing them rotting in PAL camps in zonal Germany." Unlike the Vatican immigration operation in Italy that centered on Vatican City, the rat lines of Spain, although "...fostered by the Vatican," were relatively independent of the hierarchy of the Vatican Immigration Bureau. Topic. Roman rat lines Topic. Early efforts — Bishop Hudel Bishop Alois Hudel, a Nazi sympathizer, was rector of the Pontificio Istituto Teutonico Santa Maria dell'Anima in Rome, a seminary for Austrian and German priests, and spiritual director of the German people resident in Italy. After the end of the war in Italy, Hudel became active in ministering to German-speaking prisoners of war and internees then held in camps throughout Italy. In December 1944, the Vatican Secretariat of State received permission to appoint a representative to visit the German-speaking civil internees in Italy. A job assigned to Hudel, Hudel used this position to aid the escape of wanted Nazi war criminals, including Franz Stengel, commanding officer of Treblinka, Gustav Wagner, commanding officer of Sobibor, Alois Brunner, responsible for the Drancy internment camp near Paris and in charge of deportations in Slovakia to German concentration camps, and Adolf Eichmann, a fact about which he was later unashamedly open. Some of these wanted men were being held in internment camps, generally without identity papers, they would be enrolled in camp registers under false names. 
Other Nazis hid in Italy and sought Hudel out as his role in assisting escapes became known on the Nazi grapevine. In his memoirs, Hudel said of his actions, I thank God that he allowed me to visit and comfort many victims in their prisons and concentration camps and to help them escape with false identity papers. He explained that in his eyes, the Allies' war against Germany was not a crusade, but the rivalry of economic complexes for whose victory they had been fighting. This so-called business used catchwords like democracy, race, religious liberty and Christianity as a bait for the masses. All these experiences were the reason why I felt duty-bound after 1945 to devote my whole charitable work mainly to former National Socialists and Fascists, especially to so-called war criminals. According to Mark Ahrens and John Loftus in their book Unholy Trinity, Hudel was the first Catholic priest to dedicate himself to establishing escape routes. Ahrens and Loftus claim that Hudel provided the objects of his charity with money to help them escape and, more importantly, provided them with false papers, including identity documents issued by the Vatican Refugee Organization Pontificia Commission di Assistenza. These Vatican papers were not full passports and thus were not enough to gain passage overseas. They were, rather, the first stop in a paper trail. They could be used to obtain a displaced person passport from the International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC, which in turn could be used to apply for visas. In theory, the ICRC would perform background checks on passport applicants, but in practice the word of a priest or particularly a bishop would be good enough. According to statements collected by Austrian writer Gitta Sereni from a senior official of the Rome branch of the ICRC, Hudel could also use his position as a bishop to request papers from the ICRC, made out according to his specifications. Sereni's sources also revealed an active illicit trade in stolen and forged ICRC papers in Rome at the time. According to declassified U.S. intelligence reports, Hudel was not the only priest helping Nazi escapees at this time. In the La Vista Report, Declassified in 1984, Counterintelligence Corps CIC operative Vincent La Vista told how he had easily arranged for two bogus Hungarian refugees to get false ICRC documents with the help of a letter from a Father Joseph Galev. Galev, who ran a Vatican-sponsored charity for Hungarian refugees, asked no questions and wrote a letter to his personal contact in the International Red Cross, who then issued the passports. Topic. San Girolamo Rat Line According to Ahrens and Loftus, Hudel's private operation was small scale compared to what came later. The major Roman rat line was operated by a small, but influential network of Croatian priests, members of the Franciscan Order, led by Father Kronoslav Draganovic, who organized a highly sophisticated chain with headquarters at the San Girolamo degli Illerici Seminary College in Rome, but with links from Austria to the final embarkation point at the port of Genoa. The rat line initially focused on aiding members of the Croatian Eustace including its leader or Poglavnik, Ante Pavelic, priests active in the chain included, Fr. Willem Sicilia, former deputy military vicar to the Eustace, based in Austria where many Eustace and Nazi refugees remained in hiding, Fr. Dragutin Camber, based at San Girolamo, Fr. Dominic Mandic, an official Vatican representative at San Girolamo and also general economist or treasurer of the Franciscan Order, who used this position to put the Franciscan press at the rat line's disposal, and Monsignor Carlo Petronovic, based in Genoa. Willem would make contact with those hiding in Austria and help them across the border to Italy. Camber, Mandic and Draganovic would find them lodgings, often in the monastery itself, while they arranged documentation. Finally Draganovic would phone Petronovic in Genoa with the number of required berths on ships leaving for South America. See below. The operation of the Draganovic rat line was an open secret among the intelligence and diplomatic communities in Rome. 
As early as August 1945, Allied commanders in Rome were asking questions about the use of San Girolamo as a haven. For Eustace, a year later, a U.S. State Department report of 12 July 1946 lists nine war criminals, including Albanians and Montenegrins as well as Croats, plus others, "...not actually sheltered in the Collegium Illiricum i.e., San Girolamo degli Illirici, but who otherwise enjoy church support and protection." The British envoy to the Holy See, Sir Darcy Osborne, asked Domenico Tardini, a high-ranking Vatican official, for permission that would have allowed British military police to raid ex-territorial Vatican institutions in Rome. Tardini declined and denied the church was sheltering war criminals. In February 1947, CIC Special Agent Robert Clayton Mudd reported ten members of Pavelix Eustace cabinet living either in San Girolamo or in the Vatican itself. Mudd had infiltrated an agent into the monastery and confirmed that it was honeycombed with cells of Eustace operatives, guarded by armed youths. Mudd reported, it was further established that these Croats travel back and forth from the Vatican several times a week in a car with a chauffeur whose license plate bears the two initials C.D. Corpo Diplomatico. It issues forth from the Vatican and discharges its passengers inside the monastery of San Geronimo. Subject to diplomatic immunity it is impossible to stop the car and discover who are its passengers. Mudd's conclusion was the following Dragaanovic's sponsorship of these Croat Ustashes definitely links him up with the plan of the Vatican to shield these ex Ustasha nationalists until such time as they are able to procure for them the proper documents to enable them to go to South America. The Vatican, undoubtedly banking on the strong anti-communist feelings of these men, is endeavoring to infiltrate them into South America in any way possible to counteract the spread of Red Doctrine. It has been reliably reported, for example that Dr. Vrancic has already gone to South America and that Ante Pavelic and General Kren are scheduled for an early departure to South America through Spain. All these operations are said to have been negotiated by Dragaanovic because of his influence in the Vatican. The existence of Draganovic's ratline has been supported by a highly respected historian of Vatican diplomacy, Fr. Robert Graham. I've no doubt that Draganovic was extremely active in siphoning off his Croatian Eustachy friends. Graham pointed out that Draganovic, in running his rat line, was not acting on behalf of the Vatican. Just because he's a priest doesn't mean he represents the Vatican. It was his own operation. At the same time, there were four occasions in which the Vatican did intervene on behalf of interned Ustasha prisoners. The Secretariat of State asked the UK and US governments to release Croatian POWs from British internment camps in Italy. Topic. U.S. intelligence involvement If at first U.S. intelligence officers had been mere observers of the Draganovic ratline, this changed in the summer of 1947. A now declassified U.S. Army intelligence report from 1950 sets out in detail the history of the people smuggling operation in the three years to follow. According to the report, from this point on U.S. forces themselves had begun to use Draganovic's established network to evacuate its own visitors. As the report put it, these were visitors who had been in the custody of the 430th CIC and completely processed in accordance with current directives and requirements, and whose continued residence in Austria constituted a security threat as well as a source of possible embarrassment to the commanding general of USFA, since the Soviet command had become aware that their presence in US zone of Austria and in some instances had requested the return of these persons to Soviet custody. These were suspected war criminals from areas occupied by the Red Army which the U.S. was obliged to hand over for trial to the Soviets. 
The U.S. reputedly was reluctant to do so, partly due to a belief that fair trials could hardly be expected in the USSR see Operation Keelhaul, and at the same time, their desire to make use of Nazi scientists and other resources. The deal with Draganovich involved getting the visitors to Rome. Draganovich sick handled all phases of the operation after the defectees arrived in Rome, such as the procurement of IRO Italian and South American documents, visas, stamps, arrangements for disposition, land or sea, and notification of resettlement committees in foreign lands. United States intelligence used these methods in order to get important Nazi scientists and military strategists, to the extent they had not already been claimed by the Soviet Union, to their own centers of military science in the U.S. Many Nazi scientists were employed by the U.S., retrieved in Operation Paperclip. Topic. Argentine connection. In Nuremberg at that time something was taking place that I personally considered a disgrace and an unfortunate lesson for the future of humanity. I became certain that the Argentine people also considered the Nuremberg process a disgrace, unworthy of the victors, who behaved as if they hadn't been victorious. Now we realize that they, the Allies, deserved to lose the war. Argentine President Juan Perón on the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi War Criminals in his 2002 book, The Real Odessa, Argentine researcher UKI Gonyi used new access to the country's archives to show that Argentine diplomats and intelligence officers had, on Perrin's instructions, vigorously encouraged Nazi and fascist war criminals to make their home in Argentina. According to Goni, the Argentines not only collaborated with Draganovic's ratline, they set up further ratlines of their own running through Scandinavia, Switzerland, and Belgium. According to Goni, Argentina's first move into Nazi smuggling was in January 1946, when Argentine Bishop Antonio Caggiano, leader of the Argentine chapter of Catholic Action flew with another bishop, Augustine Barrer, to Rome where Caggiano was due to be anointed cardinal. In Rome the Argentine bishops met with French Cardinal Eugène Tisserand, where they passed on a message recorded in Argentina's diplomatic archives that the government of the Argentine Republic was willing to receive French persons, whose political attitude during the recent war would expose them, should they return to France, to harsh measures and private revenge. Over the spring of 1946, a number of French war criminals, fascists and Vichy officials made it from Italy to Argentina in the same way, they were issued passports by the Rome ICRC office, these were then stamped with Argentine tourist visas, the need for health certificates and return tickets was waived on Caggiano's recommendation. The first documented case of a French war criminal arriving in Buenos Aires was Emile Duatin, later sentenced in absentia to 20 years hard labor. He sailed first class on the same ship back with Cardinal Caggiano. Shortly after this Argentinian Nazi smuggling became institutionalized, according to Goni, when Perrin's new government of February 1946 appointed anthropologist Santiago Peralta as immigration commissioner and former Ribbentrop agent Ludwig Freude as his intelligence chief. Gonyi argues that these two then set up a rescue team of Secret Service agents and immigration advisors, many of whom were themselves European war criminals, with Argentine citizenship and employment. In 2014, over 700 FBI documents were declassified revealing that the U.S. government had undertaken an investigation in the late 1940s and 1950s as to the possible escape of Adolf Hitler from Germany. Some leads purported that he had not committed suicide in Berlin but had fled Germany in 1945, and eventually arrived in Argentina via Spain. Within the pages of these documents are hundreds of statements, naming people and places involved in Hitler's alleged journey from Germany to South America including mention of the ratlines that were already in existence. Additional CIA documents contain alleged sightings and a photograph of a man resembling Hitler in Colombia in 1954.
Topic: <inaudible> Odessa and the Galen Organization. The Italian and Argentine ratlines have only been confirmed relatively recently, mainly due to research in newly declassified archives. Until the work of Ahrens and Loftus, and of UKI Goni 2002, a common view was that ex-Nazis themselves, organized in secret networks, ran the escape routes alone. The most famous such network is Odessa Organization of Former SS Members, founded in 1946 according to Simon Wiesenthal, which included SS Obersturmbannführer Otto Skorzeny and Sturmbannführer Alfred Najox and, in Argentina, Rodolfo Freuda. Alois Brunner, former commandant of Drancy internment camp near Paris, escaped to Rome, then Syria, by Odessa. Brunner was thought to be the highest ranking Nazi war criminal still alive as of 2007. Persons claiming to represent Odessa claimed responsibility for the unsuccessful July 9, 1979, car bombing in France aimed at Nazi hunters Serge and Beate Klarsfeld. According to Paul Manning, eventually, over 10,000 former German military made it to South America along escape routes Odessa and Deutsche Hilfsverein." Simon Wiesenthal, who advised Frederick Forsyth on the early 1970s novel – film script The Odessa File which brought the name to public attention, also names other Nazi escape organizations such as Spin Spider, and Sexgestern Constellation of Six. Wiesenthal describes these immediately after the war as Nazi cells based in areas of Austria where many Nazis had retreated and gone to ground. Wiesenthal claimed that the Odessa network shepherded escapees to the Catholic rat lines in Rome, although he mentions only Hudel, not Draganovich, or through a second route through France and into Francoist Spain. Odessa was supported by the Galen organization, which employed many former Nazi Party members, and was headed by Reinhard Galen, a former German Army intelligence officer employed post war by the CIA. The Galen organization became the nucleus of the BND German Intelligence Agency, directed by Reinhard Galen from its 1956 creation until 1968. Topic: <laughs> Ratline escapees. Some of the Nazis and war criminals who escaped using ratlines include Andrea Artukovic, escaped to the United States, arrested in 1984 after decades of delay and extradited to Yugoslavia, where he died in 1988 from natural causes. Klaus Barbie, fled to Bolivia in 1951 with help from the United States, as he had been an agent of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps since April 1947, captured in 1983, died in prison in France on September 23, 1991. Alois Brunner, fled to Syria in 1954, died around 2010. Herbert's Kukers, fled to Brazil in 1945, executed by Mossad in Uruguay in 1965. Adolf Eichmann, fled to Argentina in 1950, captured 1960, executed in Israel on 1 June 1962. Erebert Heim, disappeared in 1962, most likely died in Egypt in 1992. Sandor Capiro, fled to Argentina, returned to Hungary in 1996. He stood trial for war crimes in Budapest in February 2011, before his death in September. Joseph Mengele, fled to Argentina in 1949, then to other countries, died in Brazil in 1979. Ante Pavelic, escaped to Argentina in 1948, died in Spain, in December 1959, of wounds sustained two years earlier in an assassination attempt. Eric Priebke, fled to Argentina in 1949, arrested 1994, died in 2013. Walter Roth, escaped to Chile, never captured, died in 1984. Eduard Rochman, escaped to Argentina in 1948, fled to Paraguay to avoid extradition and died there in 1977. Hans Ulrich Rudel, escaped to Argentina in 1948, started the Cameradin work 
a relief organization for Nazi criminals that helped fugitives escape. Franz Stengel, fled to Brazil in 1951, arrested in 1967 and extradited to West Germany, died in 1971 of heart failure. Gustav Wagner, fled to Brazil in 1950, arrested 1978, committed suicide 1980. Topic. See also Operation Bloodstone Die Spin Carmel Afi Aunt Anna's, a safe house, in Murano, Italy, often used by Nazi and SS members Confederados, immigrants from the American South following their defeat in the American Civil War Catholic clergy involvement with the Eustace U.S. Intelligence involvement with German and Japanese war criminals after World War II.